plan. So chapter 14, we're going to see the woman anoints Jesus for his burial, and Judas betrays Jesus in the Last Supper, and, and what we're, this is the context of what I've just told you fits into this study today. Because Judas, Judas betrayed Jesus because he had a different view of Jesus than what Jesus really was. And we're not allowed to do that. Whether, we're John, whether I'm the pastor, you know, I don't get to reinvent Jesus. I don't get, get to create a different Jesus, a different theology than him. And the only way that we can really know Jesus and know his word and, is to know his word and then to stick with that and not have my own agenda that differs from Jesus. And we're going to see uh, what happens when people have their own agenda today in our study. So chapter 14, verse 1. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. So the chief priests, the high priests, the really religious Torah observant people <laughs> considered Jesus to be a false prophet that needed to be eliminated. <clears throat> and they're trying to put him to death. And so this Passover and Unleavened Bread happens in our time frame around March or April. It's where we have Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, although it doesn't fall on the same day some years. And <clears throat> Passover is on the 14th day of the Jewish month of Nisan. And this is important to understand when Jesus was actually crucified. On the 14th day of Nisan is Passover. It is the day before the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. And this is in the Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy talks about these things. And so Jesus... <clears throat> is going to be crucified on Passover. And the Jews are remembering Passover from when they were released out of Egypt on the day that death passed over them, when they were out of slavery. And unleavened bread finishes the Passover, you know, follows, immediately follows the Passover day, and the first day of unleavened bread and the seventh day of unleavened bread were what were called high Sabbaths. They were no work Sabbath days. And the importance of that uh, we'll see in the timing of Jesus' death because everybody knows that Jesus died on the day before a Sabbath. And that's why, how, what percentage of Americans do you think celebrate Good Friday, thinking that Jesus died on Friday? I, I would say maybe 90% of the Christendom celebrate Good Friday thinking Jesus died on Friday. And it stumbles many people in their faith, as I've emphasized this so often, is that then a professor, high school person, even somebody reading their Bible and they say, Jesus said he'll be three days and three nights in the earth. And they say, you can't get that from Friday. And then they think the Bible is in error. And the problem isn't that the Bible isn't in, it, the Bible is not in error. It's you have to understand the Bible. <laughs> you know, so again, I'm plugging the only way to be set free from so many false doctrines is to read the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus didn't die before the Saturday Sabbath. He died before the first day of unleavened bread. Right here, Mark is recording the, day, the feast of Passover and unleavened bread are coming. You go into the Levitical law of the Old Testament and you find out that Passover, 14th day of Nisan, immediately follows the 15th day of Nisan, first day of unleavened bread, which is a Sabbath day. And it changes every year because it's by the date of the month, just like your birthday changes every year. And so on the year that Jesus died, it would have worked out that he dies, and then three days later he rises from the grave on Sunday morning. It wasn't Friday. And uh, you can do that by studying your Bible. And in Jesus' day, that Passover unleavened bread, sometimes, and you read the gospel, sometimes it refers to the whole time as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, just like we call, what did we just have? We just had Christmas break. Right? Well, it wasn't just the 24th Christmas break or 25th. It's this time period. Same thing for the Jews. They called that those two feasts, which every Jew was required to go to Jerusalem to celebrate. They called the whole feast sometimes unleavened bread, and that's going to play an important part later on in our study today. So after two days, it was Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him Jesus to death, but they, and, and it's 
most likely they is the ruling Sanhedrin. There were 70 rulers of Israel and the high priests are coming to them and they're saying, hey, we need to get rid of this Jesus. We've had lots of discussions in our little uh, executive committee of the Jews and we want to get rid of Jesus. And they said, not during the feast, lest there be an, up, lest there be an uproar of the people. Uh, yeah, the, the people loved Jesus. They believed he was the Messiah. And yet, we're going to find out, they say later on, most of them say crucify him, or most of them. You know, again, Pentecost, thousands got saved. Why didn't tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of Jews get saved? Because most of them decided he's not who I want him to be. Why do people refuse to bow the knee to Jesus today? Because he's not who they want him to be. They want to bow a knee to a Jesus who lets them continue to live their selfish life for themselves, continue to live in sin, continue to rebel against God, to just in name only, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I don't want to believe in the real Jesus. We, we all have to believe in the real Jesus to be saved. We have to believe in the biblical Jesus to be saved. Well, um, Jesus came into the world to be the Lamb of God. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. They're planning on killing him, but the Sanhedrin says, No, the people are going to get too upset. Guess what? <laughs> he dies on Passover because God works the plan out. Jesus had to die on Passover. Many times in the Gospels, you see, they tried to grab him and kill him and throw him off a cliff at Nazareth and all these other things. And it says that, but he, he was able to escape from them because his hour had not come. His day had not come. Well, now the day is here and Jesus is ready because he has to die on Passover so that when his blood is shed, while they're, at the same time he's hanging on the cross, the Jews have rounded up tens of thousands of lambs that are being kept down by Bethlehem for Passover lamb sacrifices raised by the shepherds that years earlier had been told that the Messiah was coming. And they are slaughtering these lambs on the same day Jesus is hanging on the cross. And his, his blood is being shed so that whoever believes and trusts in him can have everlasting life and death can pass over see i'm my, this body's going to die someday but you know what i have based on the authority of the word of god the passover that happened in the egyptian you know when the, the jews were let out of slavery in egypt uh, all that has happened in my life by the power of the holy spirit i know i'm not going to die the death is going to pass over me and i pray that every single soul in this room knows that too and the only reason you wouldn't know it is because you have not yet let the blood of Jesus cover your soul, to cover you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So, then in verse 3, And being in Bethany, which is just a short walk from Jerusalem, at the house of Simon the leper, and I think it really means Simon the former leper, because Jesus never hung out with a leper he didn't heal. <laughs> so, but he probably, he probably got his name, you know, you're still Simon the leper, that now your skin is just all restored. Uh, as he sat at the table, a woman, an unnamed woman, which is important, came having an alabaster flask, a very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask, and most people that have studied the culture and everything, met, it, it means broke the seal on the flask, didn't, you know, bust the flask that had the oil, because then it says right after that, and poured it on his head. So the, this was like a prized year's wage, year's wage special spikenard oil that has seal on it, and she breaks the seal, and she walks into the room, and she pours it on Jesus' head. And uh, some people have said, well, the Bible's contradictory. John 12 has a different account. The lady is Mary, uh, uses the oil to anoint Jesus' feet and with her hair, doesn't pour it on the head. No, it's too... See, this happened twice. This happened, and see, the, the one in John chapter 12, we're going to go to one aspect of John 12 here in a minute. That's six days before Passover. This one's a couple days before the Passover. So it's interesting that two times within a week, women walk into the, into the ceremony of Jesus being around in town in Bethany, and 
They come in and they anoint Jesus both times. Judas throws a hissy because um, we're going to see here in a minute. And this is going to be amazing. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii, 300 days wages, close to a year, and given to the poor, and they criticized her sharply. And again, her equals this some woman here. Her in John 12 equals Mary, and in the context, most likely, the uh, sister of Lazarus, who Jesus had just raised from the dead. And then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. Now in John chapter 12, verse 3, it says, I don't know that this is in your notes, it says, And Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. So in John 12, 3, we see it's totally different. You know, one, break, break a flask and, you know, seal and pour it on his head. Unnamed woman, this case, it's Mary, six days before the feast, and she wipes, her, wipes his feet. Um, and I'm going to say, then, in both of these cases, it shows that the, woman, the women were more attentive to the words of Jesus than the men were. Because, again, the disciples, we, we studied what they say. They, they're saying all kinds of things. They're not listening to Jesus when he has told them five times. I'm going to go into Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be killed, spit upon and abused, and then I'm going to raise from the grave. So these two women, they, they get it. They have actually listened to what Jesus has said. And I dare say, we, we sit there and think, well, how come those disciples couldn't get it? Jesus kept talking to them, but I've noticed in my own life, and I don't really, I don't act upon what I know about Jesus with a year's wage. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think that we can all say that we don't really act upon what's left in what Jesus has said for us, have we? To flee from the things of the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life are all what contribute to our sin and and, you know, do not love the world and the things of the world because the, the world's passing away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. Do, you know, that's what Jesus said through the Apostle John. Do, do we really believe that? Um, I think that the Mary, the unnamed Mary here, uh, is Mary Magdalene. So the first Mary that anoints him, she just saw her brother raised from the dead. She says, Jesus, if you would have gotten here a little bit sooner, you could have healed my brother. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, they'll never die. Though, they, though their body dies, they won't die. And she sees her brother coming out of a grave when his body would have stunk. And he's wrapped in clothes, you know, in grave clothes. And he comes out and he's alive again. She gets it. Man, Jesus can make something dead completely alive. And I am going to give everything to him. Mary Magdalene, we know from Scripture, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 9, it says, I'm not going to read it, Mary Magdalene had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. And if she's the unnamed woman here, then she's just saying, I don't care what people think. I don't care how much this oil costs. I'm going to just put it onto Jesus. Um, you know, we're going to be spending eternity with Jesus, and it could come at any moment. So ask yourself the question, really this was earlier Communion Sunday, and maybe this is, you know, and we're going to end with a communion uh, section of scripture, but what's your alabaster box? Have you ever even thought about your alabaster uh, jar? What is the oil? What is, what is it that you're going to do in your life that says, Jesus, today this is my, uh, this is my anointing? Because I really believe what you said. I've really thought about your promises for me. I really know I am going to die and be right in your presence forever and ever and ever, washed clean. And God, in exchange for all that, I, I, I want to pour this out. What is that this out? 
Ask the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is this. Um, you know, all, all of our regrets. You ever had any regrets? They're all going to be undone. And the kingdom, when he washes away all of our memory, all of our tears are wiped away and the regrets are gone because I, I don't know about you, but there's things that I wish I could take back in life. And, and we live in this life. We live with the memory of, oh, if I had just become a believer in Jesus before this and this. Oh, if I would have just, if I would have just acted more in, in concert with what God's word said during this and this after I became a Christian. I could have not hurt somebody. I could have, I, I could have been wiser. I could have kept from sin. I could have, I, and all these regrets that we have in life and we, and we get to experience right now, but I know that's under the blood of Jesus. I know he's forgiven me. I know it's not there, but then when you get to heaven, it's gone, 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 gone forever. Isn't that worth a little drop out of an alabaster of some, some kind? Maybe not a year's wage? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they criticized her sharply. Let's turn to John chapter 12, verse 4. Um, and in John, it says that it was Judas who complained about this, and not because he really cared about the poor, but because he was the treasurer and collected the money. And chapter 12, verse 4, it says, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? In both cases, it was extremely valuable anointing oil and given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put into it. You know, so many people um, you know, say, oh, I cared about the poor, you know, politicians, <laughs> you know. We're going to make you give money because we're going to do this effort for the poor. And then you find out really what it is, is they got their own money and their own agenda. <clears throat> and, but here we have Judas. He's been following Jesus for, for three years. He's watched the healings. He's heard every sermon from the perfect pastor, Jesus. Perfect pa Everything Jesus has ever said is perfect. Everything he's ever done is perfect. And yet his heart is, I'm going to follow this guy because he'll make me rich. And how many people are there today that say, I want to, use the, I want to throw around this Jesus thing to be in a better association of people, to get rich. You know, I, again, I fear for those people that I can see preaching the gospel. It seems like it's all so that they can manipulate people to give them money. And it's going to, Jesus says, whoa. To those who offend, uh, it would be better for them, you know, for Judas, better for him if he had not been born. Uh, so, again, let's look at your heart. Why do you serve Jesus? Is it because he saved you from sin? It's because he died on the cross, took your place in death, that he allowed himself to be separated from the Father when he said, if my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He took that separation for that moment. He took that separation for all of humanity, for all of eternity in a moment. He took it upon himself so that I would not have to be separated from the God who created the heavens and the earth and me and wanted me to enjoy his fellowship forever and ever. Is that the reason why I come to church? Is that the reason why I call myself a Christian? Is that the reason why I read my Bible? Or is there some other my agenda in there? And I pray again. I hope there's nobody here that has any agenda, but I love Jesus because of what he did for me on the cross. <sighs> Going back to Mark chapter 14, verse 5, for it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always has that come true has there always been poor among us yeah jesus made another prophecy two thousand years has been fulfilled there's always been poor 
And despite man's efforts to throw money and say, we're going to eliminate poverty. <laughs> you know, when I was a young kid, they actually, the big deal that was coming out, and they were saying, we're going to eliminate poverty. Well, all, they don't read their Bible. God says, you're not going to eliminate poverty. In fact, there is only one place in the Bible that says about eliminating poverty, and it's in Deuteronomy 15.4. And, and by the way, the law has all kinds of how to minister to the poor. You're not supposed to completely harvest your, your field. You're supposed to, you know, you, you hit a sickle into the standing grain and you go to grab your hand to put it into the, into the sheaves, uh, binding up the sheaves, and you drop it. You're not allowed to pick it back up. You've got to leave it there on the ground and you bind the sheaves and you take all the sheaves and you take them to the threshing floor and whatever's left in the field is for, that's the welfare system in God's economy. People that, you hungry? You don't have a job? Whatever happened? Go into the field. There it is. Same thing with the grapes. Same with everything. You, there were, God's law had a perfect provision to make sure that everybody had a coat on their back, had food in their stomachs and a roof over their head. And God said, but, but there was all kinds of provision for the poor because they wouldn't listen to law. But Deuteronomy 15.4 says, except you don't have to worry about the poor when there may be no poor among you, for the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance only. You will not have poor only if you carefully obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe with care all these commandments which I command you today. It, again, if you read through the Bible, read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, read the law of God, and then ask yourself the question, if we were to truly, if the world were to truly adopt the, the thinking of God, what would that do to the prosperity? If everybody wanted to do what God said to do, what would that do? We would be rich, there would be no poor. How many trillions of dollars are spent in the judicial system of, of this country? You know, or billions, I'll say billions. <laughs> How many billions of dollars in jails, policemen, police cars, you know, all the infrastructure to spy and look at what everybody's doing and everything because we got to make sure that we keep criminals from, you know, terrorizing the rest of us. Well, if everybody obeys the law of God, you don't need any of it. How many billions of dollars lost in drug and alcohol abuse and broken families and, you know, all the, all the broken families that happen as a result of immorality? All of it. What, what if there was no single children, you know, single mothers, no unwed mothers in society? And children growing up with just one parent, when they, sh we, they were created by God to have two parents. What if there was, no, there was no divorce because there was no adultery, because there was no uh, self -sin What if, wow, trillions of dollars. And it's all been studied. Anyway, there's, they, they have a number on each one of these things, and it's billions and billions and billions of dollars. And then you take that worldwide, trillions of dollars. And, but people would rather mock the Bible, throw it away, say it's no good, rather than submit to the God and try. And, and we have a sinful nature that even as Christians, and we know it's true, uh, we know Christians that have fallen into sin, that have destroyed their lives, destroyed their finances. Isn't it good that Jesus died on the cross for even that? Isn't it good that Jesus is going to forgive us and wipe away those sorrows and those, and those times where we just, you know, hey, sin came. Somebody else's sin came and affected me. My sin came and affected other people. And there's tears that are flowing through the whole situation. But Jesus is going to wipe away the tears when we get out of this crazy world and get out of this crazy sinful bodies and we are completely in a new body that's fit for eternity, that never sins, never tempted again. Is that worth an alabaster drop? <laughs> for you have the poor with you always, and wherever you w whenever you wish, you may do them good, but me, you do not have always. You know, if you, have you ever thought if you had a time machine, where would it be the place you'd want to go? I want to go to those three years. I want to sit with the Son of God where you, you know you're talking to somebody that's not just smarter than you, wiser than you, whatever. You're sitting with God with us. You're sitting with the person that you could say, what's it really going to be like? What's, what's going to really happen? And you can ask him, you're sitting with the creator of the universe. 
Oh, man. Wouldn't that be something? And see, they didn't get that. Even though he's told them, even though they've heard Mary, mother of Jesus, say, I was conceived as a virgin and all this other stuff and everything, they're not treating him. They're not acting like we're sitting with God. Get out, you know, get, you're wasting money. <laughs> Jesus going, they're, they're believing I'm about to die and they're anointing me and you're only going to see me for a few more days. And two more days till I die, 40 days after that, and then I'm gone for 2,000 years, and you're going to regret that you weren't helping her to pour the oil on. And the same thing for us. We're, we're going to see Jesus. He's coming, and we are going to see him for who he is. She, was, she has done what she could, she has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. You know, I, at times I read through the scripture, and I think, what would I want on a tombstone if I ever get one? And, you know, this would be a good one. Uh, he did what he could. <laughs> because Jesus has forever memorialized these two women with this statement that she did what she could. Wouldn't that be cool to say, you know, yeah, you did what you could in service to Jesus. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel, good news, is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as her memorial to her. Jesus prophesied it, and here we are today doing the same, fulfilling this prophecy, talking about this woman, these women, actually. And he makes it clear here that this gospel is going to be preached to the whole world. Jesus didn't come for just the Jews. And the disciples, again, had a hard time understanding that. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And I think then means after the second time of seeing money slip through his fingers. Because he joined Jesus in his mind because they have found the Messiah. The Jews wanted their Messiah to not die on the, sins for, on the cross, for the, die for their sins on the cross for them. They wanted him to rule. So, so Judas is believing in a Jesus who Jesus was not, instead of the Jesus who was. And he's trying to force Jesus' hand. Man, Jesus, what's with all this? You know, anointing, talking about death. I'm going to betray you they're going to come arrest you and you're going to have to do something because and the reason why i believe this is his motivation is because he was a good jew none of the others could tell that he was the betrayer and because as soon as he sees jesus actually being spit upon and beaten and on his way to the cross he's so grieved for what he has done he goes and kills himself so the only thing that makes sense is he was not really thinking jesus was going to die is he was thinking, I'll force his hand. I'll betray him. He'll stop. We'll get rich. The kingdom's going to be set up, and I'm going to be the treasurer. <clears throat> All because Judas did not want to believe in the biblical Jesus. And when they, the chief priests, heard it, that he was willing to betray them, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conversely betray him, and as a result, the plan, which was aborted because of the Sanhedrin, apparently, now the chief priests go, okay, we got him. Now we've got a betrayer, and we're going to be able to probably met with the Sanhedrin again. We know that the Sanhedrin met and voted about Jesus because it says that Joseph of Arimathea and, and uh, Nicodemus did not vote with them to kill Jesus. Um, so it looks like Judas betrayed Jesus for money. You know, you can ask your friends this question when they say, yeah, I don't believe in Jesus. So what are you betraying him for? Fame? You betraying Jesus for fame? Or is it for money? Because you'd, you'd be considered, um, you know, be considered an outcast from your family, so you want to be able to have relationships. So you're going to betray Jesus for a temporary relationship with a family member or friend or coworker? that would mock you and scorn you for being a Christian? I was just talking to somebody before, before the service that you know, they have to work with a Muslim. The Muslim hates him, hates him because, and acts like he hates him throughout the workday because 
it all, when, it, when he first came in, he said, oh, you're a Christian, we worship the same God. And he said, no, we don't. Actually, we don't. And by him not accolading him and saying, yeah, we worship the same God, by telling him the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you reject Jesus as the savior of the world, that he died on the cross for our sins. You reject that that happened. You reject that he was God in flesh, Emmanuel, with us. And by rejecting that, you rejected the God of the Bible, and therefore you've rejected. Our gods are not the same. Well, he was willing to do that because he really believes in Jesus. I mean, the Christian was willing to sacrifice a relationship at the office, at the job. Are you willing to say, what are, you know, see, the thing is, we either betray Jesus, we either betray Jesus and the truth of the gospel, or we betray the lies of the world. And I would rather betray the world that's what Jesus asked us to do. Get, die to the world. Forget the world. The world's passing away. The world's temporary. The world can't save us. Um, you know, some betray Jesus so they can live life the way they want to. You know, and here we are, 2,000 years, reading about Judas who betrayed Jesus. What's history going to show for you? And again, for you Christians, tell people, tell them this. What's history going to show if, my, if this is really true, if what I'm telling you is the truth about Jesus, what is, what is history going to show? That you rejected this message for some temporary reason, and then you stand before God and he says, you rejected my Jesus, although you, gave, you were given opportunity, and history will show you betrayed Jesus for all of eternity. Now on the first day of... You know, and here's where I was saying the first day of unleavened bread. Actually not. It was actually the, the day of Passover, which here Mark is referring to the entire Passover unleavened bread feast as unleavened. Actually, as Passover was coming, the 14th day of Nisan, when they killed the Passover lamb, which clearly says it's the 14th day of Nisan, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go to prepare that you may eat Passover. So the sun is setting on the 13th day of Nisan, and in Jewish reckoning, as soon as the sun goes away, you're into the next day on the Jewish calendar. You're into the 14th day of Nisan, the day that they, after the night, <laughs> after the night, the day, for the Jews, the day comes after the night, then uh, the day they're going to be killing the Passover lambs, which we know is the day that Jesus hung on the cross. Um, they when they killed the Passover lamb as Jesus is hanging on the cross. And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water, follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Um, so... Um, <laughs> You know, amazing. Jesus t earlier told his disciple, Peter, you know, the tax collector is coming. Peter, just go throw a fish hook in the Sea of Galilee, pull up the fish, gut it, find a coin, you know, in, in the mouth. How in the world? I, I mean, it's just the Jesus. See, some people say that Jesus doesn't know everything. They say that he only knows what's knowable. There's a theology called limited open theology or limited foreknowledge of God. They actually believe that God doesn't know anything. But Jesus can sit there and go, I, I have already seen this. I've seen all of history. I stand outside of history. I see what people do. All you need to do is go up to this guy that's carrying a picture, walk, talk to his master, say, give me the upper room. And then we're going to be there. So then he will show you a large upper room, finished, furnished, and prepared. There make ready for us. Now, what would a normal person do? I mean, imagine you're, you're a homeowner with a large upper room there in Jerusalem, chief real estate. Your servant comes in, and right behind the servant is a couple of disciples from Jesus. And they say, oh, by the way, uh, we're taking over. We, we're supposed to take whatever you're going to give us for the te because the teacher wants it. A normal person would say, wait, 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 what are you talking about? But see, we have to read between the lines. This man must have known teacher Jesus. 
And you know what, teacher, you know, when you know teacher Jesus, when you know Savior Jesus, and you know he wants something, what's your attitude then? Whatever Jesus wants, Jesus gets. That's the attitude of Christian normal. See, it's not normal for the world to do that. It's not even normal for my flesh to do that today. My flesh is, okay, I've got this part of my life, Jesus, and this is the way I want my life to be, and I'm going to serve you until you come. But how... This is a challenge to me and to you. Are you willing for the disciple to walk in and say, Jesus wants a little bit more of what your life is. He wants, he wants the upper room today. He wants, he wants, uh, <laughs> you know, today we're going to have, I, I thought about saying this during the announcement time, but, and I was thinking that, you know, I, I'm going to give you the Bible overview handouts so that you could be ready for tonight if you come to the evening service by reading 22 pages out of the book to be, you know, we're going to go through Genesis, the reason for studying the Bible and everything and through Genesis. And I thought, well, if I tell them to try and do that before, that, that might interfere with the Seahawks game, you know, and so, or football, for those people that are into football. And, and I'm just saying, it's so liberating to just say, God, I want whatever I have to devote to you. Because these other things are meaningless. They really are. It, again, if we just really understand what's important, and I'm not, you know, the Holy Spirit has to do it, not me. I'm not saying, can't watch a game, God do this, Dad do that. I'm just saying, I don't think that we enough sit there and go, Jesus, what do you have for me today? What's this need that comes up for somebody, or should I call somebody and encourage them? I haven't seen them. Are they, are they sick? Are they some place, should I know what's going on in their life? Get, be more aware of the people, because we, we live in a time where we don't even know who lives right next to us in our house. How many of you know everybody on your street? Oh, there are some. Yeah, I know, but you're cheating. You only got two people on your street. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Okay, so for you that live on something, you know, I, I, I'd have to say I don't know everybody on my street. I don't. It's not that long of a street. But I'm just, you know, may God help us. Amen? May God help us to understand that just like that guy was willing to give the upper room, what are we willing to really do in light of eternity, in light of the alabaster, in light of what Jesus has really said about our future, to really believe what he said about our future? So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover in the evening. He came with the twelve. Now as they sat and ate, Jesus said assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And again, how shocking this would have been to them. They've, been, they've all been with him for three years. They've, they have been sent out two by two to cast out demons. And they must have all cast out demons, including Judas. They were all sent out to go heal. They must have all healed, including Judas, in the name of Jesus, risking their lives. They, when Jesus says, we're going to go to Jerusalem, they go, okay, um, I guess we're going to die with him. I mean, they, they're all risking their lives. But one of them, his heart, was only willing to risk his life for the chance of getting the money pot. And that they couldn't see. That only two people knew, Jesus and Judas. You, other people can't see it. And they began to be sorrowful and said, and to say to him, one by one, is it I? And another said, it, is it I? And he answered and said to them, it is the, one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. So they're eating, and again, the way they would eat, they would recline sideways, and we know that John was on Jesus' right hand because it's, John says, the one who laid his bosom on Jesus at the Last Supper, so that means that, you know, Jesus is here, John is here, and so when John would talk to Jesus, he would be like on his bosom side. The one that dips the sop with me would have been Judas, so Judas was on the left-hand side of Jesus. And right and left-hand sides are the places of esteem. And so that's why the other, the other disciples weren't saying, I've always been wondering about Judas. Now we know. Jesus says, one, he's, they, they think they're it instead of him. 
The Son of Man indeed goes just as is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Some people think, they, some people teach that Judas is in heaven because he did what he was supposed to do. Well, Jesus said it would have been better for him not to be born. <laughs> and so if he's in heaven, it's a good thing he was born, right? Jesus said he's a son of perdition, he ends up in the lake of fire. And he's suffering for all of eternity. Starting now, waiting until he goes to the official lake of fire at the great white throne judgment. And yet he was religious. He was extremely religious. Looked, looked like a Christian. Went to synagogue. Went, did everything except have a heartfelt relationship for Jesus. Oh, may God not let anyone here be in that same predicament. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it, in, drink it new in the kingdom of God. So we did... We just took a communion this morning. Jesus saying, this bread is symbolic of the fact that I'm going to put my body on the cross for you. And this cup, this wine, is symbolic of the fact that I'm going to shed my blood for you for a new covenant. And when he says new covenant, the Jews, they would have known. He's talking Jeremiah that there's going to be a new relationship because the law was not able to make us perfect, the new relationship, the new covenant that Jeremiah says is a covenant where I'm going to have him change my heart because he's forgiven me of my sin. And that's all true Christians. Something changes. You know, it's hard to tell Judas, but you can tell a little bit with a true Christian because you can see that the Holy Spirit is changing the heart. There's a humility, a desire to do what God wants to do, even if we don't do it. At least there's a heart to want to do it. So his disciples went out and came to the city and found it just, or I'm sorry, I didn't flip the page here. And verse 26, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and they're singing a hymn of Passover unleavened bread time, a song of ascents. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And that's in Zechariah 13, 7, Jesus saying it applies to him. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Now, here again, lat, this is just, just, just the night he's being betrayed. Three days, they only have to remember this for three days. So when they see him get crucified, Hey guys, no sweat. We don't need to be hiding in our, in our rooms. We don't need to wonder where it is. We don't need to not believe the women who come and tell us that the tomb is empty. We don't have to wonder because Jesus said he's going to raise and he's going to go to Galilee. Let's go to Galilee. Let's just go to Galilee now and we'll wait for Jesus. Why didn't they do that? Because they didn't really believe what Jesus said. The women believed what Jesus really said. <laughs> the men didn't believe what Jesus really said. Um, Peter said to him, will, will we believe what Jesus has said? Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not. Jesus said to him, surely I say to you, because he had already seen it all play out. He stands outside of history. Surely I say to you that today, even this night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Well, see, later on that night, now wait a second, Jesus, you know, wait a second, Jesus, Later on, just a few hours, just a few hours later, and the, the arresting party is coming, and Peter grabs his sword, and he just goes to whack away. He's willing to die. Willing to die for what? The wrong Jesus. See, once again, it's so important. Jesus said, I'm going to go and die, and Peter is saying, you can't die. I'm going to protect you. So he should have listened to Jesus. So he's willing to die for a Jesus that is not the Jesus that came. We, we have to completely surrender. And this is what's so important. A lot of 
Christians are holding on to America more than Jesus. A lot of Christians are holding on to conservatism more than Jesus. They're, they're doing all kinds of things. You know, I want to believe in the Jesus that's going to keep America. When Jesus said all the nations of the world are going to be reduced to nothing until it morphs into a ten-nation world empire, what does that mean? <laughs> if I believe in prophecy, they didn't believe in prophecy that lasted a few hours. If we believe in prophecy, America is going to die because there is going to be a final ten-nation world empire that's coming. Now, I can grieve over it be, for all the reasons in this world that I can grieve over the fact that we've had a, a great run, haven't we? We've had a great run in America. And we love raising our families and everything. But all we have to do is wake up and see what's going on and realizing it would take a miracle of complete repentance, completely turning back to God, uh, the whole nation turning back to God for there to be any hope for us, and we see nothing of the sort on the horizon. And therefore, I have to lay that down. I have to lay it down. And I have to just keep my mind focused on what Jesus told me and what he left me here to do. And I could go on and on and on with all these other reasons. But Peter, is, he's wanting a Jesus that doesn't die. <laughs> Aren't we so glad that Jesus got his way instead of Peter? Um, but he spoke more vehemently, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said, likewise, and let's turn to cl conclude our study with John chapter 2, verse 18. We're going back two years in time to the first Passover of Jesus' ministry, maybe three years. And they're all saying, no, no, we'll die with you. We, there's no way we're going to deny Well, in John chapter 2, verse 18, to conclude our study. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? And we've talked about it. They wanted him to do like Moses did, you know, with the staff turning into a serpent, etc., etc. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it, raise it up. And the Jews said... It has taken 46 years to build this temple on the Temple Mount, the one that Herod built. And will you raise it up in three days? Verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. <laughs> now see again, here's, here's the beginning of the ministry. Peter's saying, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill anybody that tries to kill you. You can't do this. And, you know, Jesus has been rebuked, Peter, for saying, no, you can't die earlier on. And they're just sticking in their mind with what they want. And Jesus is saying, destroy this temple, meaning his body, and in three days I'm going to raise it up. The disciples should have been totally having a different attitude the night that Jesus was betrayed, but they didn't because they didn't believe until after he rose from the grave. Um, <clears throat> now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. And then this is what's so important. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. It's troubling to me. You know, he knows. <laughs> See, he knows us. Oh, they're, they're, they're believing in me because of the signs they saw today. But three years from now, a good chunk of those are going to be saying, crucify him. God knows what's in us. You know what's in us is a horrible cancer of unbelief, pride, and rebellion against God. To not really believe what he has said. To not act and, li and live and walk in this world as if we really believe what God has said. And yet, by the power of his Holy Spirit, we should, all true believers should sense that we're moving on, aren't we? We're getting closer to him every year. We're getting into that relationship that's deeper every time. And the word of God continues to work with meshing with the Holy Spirit so that maybe there's something, the Holy Spirit will touch you and touch me a little bit more of the alabaster in some way. A little bit more of 
just given our lives to Jesus in these last days and let the things of the world go because they're passing away. Amen. Hi, I'm Kevin Lee, pastor of Calvary Church. I want to thank you for joining us in this portion of our Taste and See ministry as a church. As the verse says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. It's not just our Sunday morning broadcast, but we'll go out in the community. We go to the Kitsap County Fair to help people understand how good it is to really take the Lord at his word and draw close to him so he can draw close to you. We're here to help you in any way we can. I hope this ministry of the broadcast and BCAT has been a blessing to you and your family. But don't just stop at listening and, and thinking about and pondering the things of God's word. It's important for you to come into that saving relationship with him. To become born again, that he would become your Lord. You'd turn away from your sin and come towards Jesus and, and believe and trust him. Get a Bible, pick it up, read it, and learn about the great God who so loved you that he sent Jesus Christ in the world to die on the cross for your sins that you might have everlasting life. Hope to see you in heaven. God bless.